Hi and welcome to The Honest Channel. I'm Claire Johnston, a journalist with an interest in all things anti-aging and how to age well. And if the eagle-eyed among you spot a strange mark on my forehead today, that's because I managed to get a great big cut on it when I bent over on my way to the bathroom in the night to pick something up and then I caught the edge of a large cardboard box. Not my smartest move. Fortunately, you won't have to look at it for too long because today I'm bringing you an interview about our hormonal health recorded before I had my tussle with a box. For most women, our estrogen and progesterone levels have a big impact, not just on our reproductive health, but they can also affect our bone density, cholesterol levels, blood pressure, mood, and sleep. That's why when our levels of these hormones drop due to the menopause, we can start to get all kinds of unwanted symptoms, including anxiety and low mood, but also changes to our skin, joint stiffness, difficulty sleeping, Unfortunately, the list goes on. These can be addressed through hormone replacement therapy, but we're often warned of a small but increased risk of some types of cancer, including breast cancer linked to HRT. This is also true of the combined contraceptive pill. And now a new study has been causing alarm because it has found that progesterone only contraception, including intrauterine devices or IUDs, are associated with the same increased risk of breast cancer. Oxford University researchers analysed the data for thousands of women with invasive breast cancer aged between 20 and 49 and found the different types of contraception all appeared to increase risk. And that made me wonder what this means on two fronts, both for those of us using hormonal contraception and also for those like me who use a progesterone-only IUD to help control perimenopausal symptoms, including heavy bleeding, and also where we are more widely when it comes to HRT. Well, here to put this research in context, as she does beautifully, is TV doctor and general practitioner Philippa Kay, who's also the author of a new book called Breasts, in which she shares some essential facts about these important yet objectified body parts. She's also written books on the menopause, pregnancy, childbirth and early years. And having been diagnosed with bowel cancer a few years ago, she shares her own experience in the book Doctors Get Cancer Too, and I'll link to some of her most recent books in the description. She is hugely invested in health education, and she has both a reassuring message for us today and also some helpful advice around lowering our risk of developing some of the most common types of cancer. So let's hear now from Dr. Philippa Kay. Dr. Philippa, thank you so much for joining me on the channel and congratulations on the publication of your book. It is exciting um, and it's a totally new sort of area. So breast books focus on breastfeeding and they focus on breast cancer. And nothing yeah. really teaches us how to manage breasts throughout our entire lives. And that's what this book is about. Yeah, totally clear. Um, and I also noticed that you had written a book on the menopause which um, yeah, I'm looking yeah. forward to talking to you about as well. And another on your experience of being diagnosed and treated uh, for bowel cancer. And that um, was, that's right. that, was that four years ago that that happened? Um, so it's coming up to four years ago that I was diagnosed. I was 39 at the time. Um, and I had no intention of publishing that at all. It was my diary. And I wrote my diary because I, I needed to get the thoughts out of my head. Um, and it was probably... Oh, at least a year in that that my publisher, my agent said, do you know what? I think that there's value. I know that you're writing it. I think that there's value in it. And then it took me a good while to be convinced mm. because it's one thing writing about health and public health and women's health. And another thing to to give you me. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, different. and this was me and it was my family. And and then an editor comes along and says, well, I don't think this is relevant. I'm like, those are my thoughts. What are you doing? <laughs> Why are you taking a red pen to my thoughts? Which is very different from saying, oh, this study isn't needed or that study isn't needed. So um, yeah. it was a very different experience. But I have to say that it was the response has been phenomenal. And even now on my social media, I get messages all the time from cancer patients, from relatives of cancer patients or friends, um, and how much that impacted them and how they felt far less lonely. Yeah. So I'm very glad that I did it. Well, it gives you a really different perspective as well, because you have been a patient in such a difficult situation like that and and obviously you're used to working with people as a doctor 
So, um, I mean, has it has that really you were already interested in sharing health information, but has that really propelled that sense of just wanting to share as much good information as you can about women's health? I think that um, cancer patients and patients, actually anybody with a long term health condition, are really vulnerable because we just want it to be better. And yeah. our friends and our family just want it to be better. So you're vulnerable to misinformation information um you're mm -hmm. vulnerable to any purveyor of snake oil because you just want something to take it away so yeah. it definitely changed um how sort of forceful i am about putting out correct evidence-based information but i think that actually it changed me more as a doctor and i know exactly the moment that it changed me as a doctor and it was in my first hospital stay on icu and things had gone a little bit awry shall we say mm -hmm. and it was some point in, in silly o'clock in the morning and my heart monitors were going crazy and I felt really awful and when you're in ICU you have a nurse with you the whole time one mm -hmm. on one um, and a doctor appeared and instead of getting the drugs to reverse what was going on which he did too, but it, at the beginning what he did was he sat down on my bed and he held my hand and he said, you're having a really shit time. Mm. And I held on to his hand. And actually, that was what made it better. Not what he did afterwards, which is what actually made it better medically. But that acknowledgement of the human in me mm -hmm. for just a minute was what I needed. Yeah. And doctors we go straight to the fixing because that's why we became doctors because I want to help and I want to yeah. make it better um and we go straight to the fixing but actually what people often need is an acknowledgement of where they are in the first place and that has really changed me as a doctor so that when people come and they tell me whatever awful thing is happening or or you know whatever situation it is for a moment to say I see you and I can see how hard that is for you and then you see their heads come up and their eyes meet yours. And just for a minute, that's what made them feel better. And it isn't medicine, it's person. It's using yourself as a doctor. But there are that's really the pivotal moment for me in my whole cancer treatment that changed who I was. So often when we're dealing with doctors as patients, it can be quite an intimidating experience. And I often get very nervous when I'm at the doctor and you know, intimidated, trying to, you know, get my symptoms out and um, to, just to have somebody who can look at you on a level and connect with you as a human just calms you down, doesn't it? And, and, and you can actually then get into a proper conversation about what's going on. How is your health now? Um, it's OK. I have another surgery coming up soon, um, right. but OK. Um, yeah. We we carry on Can currently cancer free, which is about as hopeful as one could ever be it's all one ever wants is that you know to say cancer free currently so that's good oh absolutely um well i wanted to talk to you today about our hormonal health which i, I guess i'm splitting into two categories for my audience so you know the first is is looking at the contraceptive pill and it's linked with breast cancer and then for for viewers of more my age range hormone replacement therapy and its associated risks because I think we've known for some time that the combined contraceptive pill you know where it includes estrogen and progesterone that has been associated with a small increased risk in developing breast cancer but we thought that progesterone only contraception was slightly less risky was that not actually we didn't know I thought it was less risky <laughs> and now I'm like eh. because of that new research Mm. The new research produced headlines which scared people. Yeah, um, scared me. Headlines, headlines are not the same as understanding the science behind that. Yes. It's very complicated statistics that go on um, that I studied in sort of in university and still found really, found really difficult, often find really difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's difficult to just whittle that down into a headline. Mm -hmm. We have no for a while um, that there is a very small increased risk of breast cancer while you're taking the combined hormonal contraceptive pill, the pill, the one with estrogen and progesterone, that risk declines um, as you stop taking the pill. 
And you would have thought, well, why would it do that? Because um, actually, the more times that you ovulate increases your risk of breast cancer. So pregnancy and breastfeeding are, are, are protective. So, well, if I'm on the pill and I'm not ovulating, why isn't that protective? And we think that's to do with the, the much bigger doses that you would be getting when you're on the pill. However, if you think about the furore about HRT and breast cancer versus the pill and breast cancer, young women mm. don't tend to think about that, but they should be told. But we didn't really know the impact of progesterone only forms. And by that, I mean mini pills, older types, newer types, injections, implants um, and hormone coils. Now, for anyone listening who's got a copper coil, that is not the same. A right, copper, okay, coil, that's, yes. copper coil, which can last up to 10 years, depending which one you have, um, contains no hormone at all. So mm -hmm. we didn't know what the impact was. And this new study compared women who had a um, breast cancer diagnosis and looked at their history of being prescribed contraception, progesterone only contraception, and it showed right. a slight increase. Now, when you look at the headlines, it says increases your risk by about 25%. That's a quarter. And everyone goes, oh, yeah. And actually, the real numbers are if you are about 30 and you take it for five years, you get an extra 265 cases per 100,000 women. If you are age 16 to 20, an extra eight cases per 100,000 women. So those numbers are small. And the reason mm -hmm. that the numbers are small is because breast cancer is a condition which gets more and more frequent as you get older. Plus, everything in medicine, everything in life is a way scale of risk and benefit. The risks of pregnancy are significant. Risks of blood clots in the legs, blood clots in the lungs, high blood pressure, diabetes, the risks of labor, of bleeding, of infection, yeah. of nausea and vomiting, the mental health issues, postnatal anxiety, postnatal um, depression. You know, and I can keep going. The potential health risks of unwanted pregnancies, the risks potentially of terminations, or if you continue the mental health risks that come with that, we need to weigh those up in the balance. Mm. Plus, we use hormonal contraception for all kinds of things which aren't even contraception. So yeah. I might, you might have a myrena coil because you have really heavy periods or you yeah. have fibroids that is causing, causing heavy periods or you have really painful periods or you have endometriosis or you have acne. We might be using the contraceptive pill for. We might be using it for severe PMS or premenstrual dysmorphic disorder. And these are all conditions which really affect women's quality of life. And so when you do that risk benefit ratio, generally, it would come down on the side of benefit of mm -hmm. being on mm -hmm. a form of hormonal contraceptive. And that isn't to say that I, but I would still really welcome this kind of study because women need to know so that they can yeah. make their choices. Here's what the study didn't show, didn't tell us. It didn't look at women who were at high risk of breast cancer. It didn't look at women who were BRCA positive. It doesn't tell us anything about the family history of the women. It doesn't tell us about other risk factors for breast cancer so maybe you were on a form of progesterone only contraception because we chose not to use the combined pill estrogen and um, progesterone because you had obesity because you had high blood pressure maybe you smoked maybe you hmm. also drink lots of alcohol and actually alcohol and obesity are really big risk factors for developing breast cancer yeah. So until we can whittle down this information further, there is a long way to go. Yes, there yeah. is an increased risk, but that increased risk is small and has to be weighed in the balance. So it's a don't panic at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's and, don't and panic. And if you are concerned, go and talk to your doctor about it because all advice that we would give in such a situation like this can only be general because I don't know your past medical history you know yeah. we don't have the notes or anything else of the listeners but if you are concerned go and speak to your doctor but not being on contraception also has risks yeah yeah and it's really important to say that I also wanted to look at it from the other side so for women in my age range because when I was reading the reports um around this research. There were a few sort of throwaway lines about, oh, and of course, women over 50, they're at a, a much increased risk. Uh, but, the, but the research was done on women under 50. 
So I was thinking, well, where does that leave somebody like me? So, you know, you mentioned the, the Marina um, coil. Now, I use that to try and mitigate some of the, the heavy bleeding that you talked about, you know, these, these perimenopausal symptoms. It's been absolutely life changing for me. Um, I mean, I was really struggling before. And so I look at that and I think, oh, that's a real blow because I'm at that age where I'm at an increased risk. Does this mean I'm at an even higher risk? Hormone replacement therapy, it feels to me like women have, have kind of had two messages thrown at them, which is if you don't replace your hormones, you know, you could advance, you know, you can accelerate aging because it can affect your bones and your muscle mass. And But if you do take it, you know, beware. And it's that, oh, that's that we feel like we have to weigh up the risks all the time. I mean, where, where do you sit on this? <laughs> so first of all, HRT is not the fountain of youth. Um, yeah. I wish that it was, but it isn't. And we are not currently allowed to use it for disease prevention alone. That's what the guidance says. Now, the guidance might change as research changes, but until you have research that says if you take it and you don't have symptoms, you will still prevent X, Y, and Z. Until it says that, um, then we wouldn't start it solely for disease prevention. Um, women are have a unique place, I think, in medicine, because when it comes to women's health, women go to the doctor all the time when they're not unwell. So they go to manage their periods and they go because they want to get pregnant and they go because they are pregnant and, and being pregnant is not a state of ill health. So they're going simply to say, can you help me manage being a woman? But they're not unwell. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that's sort of unique um, and really interesting. And we need to help them much more. Because actually, no one should be stuck in the toilet for three days and missing school, missing work because their periods are so heavy. Um, and yet we're in a position where lots of women are. As I said, everything is a balance. And that balance will be different for everybody. One in four women won't have symptoms of the menopause, but one in 10 will have symptoms which are so severe they have thoughts of suicide. Mm. And so that balance of risk and benefit is going to be completely different in each of those women yeah. now when it comes to, to lots of the risks associated with hrt i can mitigate lots of them by how i give you the hrt um, and what kind of hrt i give you so for example hrt oral hrt is associated with an increased risk of blood clots in the legs and in the lungs and that's because when you take something into your stomach um, the liver tries to break it down the liver is also involved in producing clotting factors and that increases your risk but if I give you your estrogen through the skin, be that gel patch or spray, there is no increased risk. So I can mitigate that risk. Mm -hmm. If you have a womb and I give you estrogen alone, estrogen is like grass seed and light and sun and the lining of your womb would grow and grow and grow. And if I let your lawn grow and grow and grow, eventually you will get some weeds. So progesterone is our lawnmower. It stabilizes the lining of the womb. And so if you have um, a womb, Giving progesterone stops the risk of womb cancer, which would happen if we gave um, estrogen alone. So by changing what I do, I can change that risk. But there is a small increased risk um, of HRT with um, breast cancer. Mm -hmm. I say small. Let's put some numbers in to help people. Between 50 and 59, 23 women out of every thousand will develop breast cancer. Not related to HRT. If you drink and smoke, you have an extra three and five cases per thousand. If you have obesity, an extra 24 cases per thousand. And if you take combined HRT, the old fashioned one, you have about four cases more per thousand. So actually it's not that HRT is giving us hundreds of extra, hundreds yeah. of extra yeah. cases. It's the same as drinking and smoking and it's mm -hmm. less than having obesity. And these are things that people sort of might do without necessarily even thinking about it. So you could be on combined HRT and stop drinking and smoking and actually still end up with the same risk. Exercise and you're going to decrease your risk. Yeah. Um, and that's really important to know. But actually with the most modern form of progesterone, body identical progesterone called micronized progesterone or uterogestan, there is no increased risk for the first five years. So we can affect risk. Now, when you look at a study like this and it says, well, for all those women who are taking the coil, the hormone coil, there's an increased risk. For people who are on HRT, 
but they're also using a mini pill or an injection for contraception because you still need to have contraception for two years if you have your menopause under the age of 50, one year after the age of 50, everyone can stop by 55. But lots of people will be saying, well, hang on, I'm using utrogestan and something. Mm -hmm. Or I'm using the coil instead of another form of progesterone. Now what? And the truth is we don't necessarily yet know because that piece of research did not tell us in this particular age group you could extrapolate the data and say well maybe if it's increased here then it might also be increased there and and that's definitely a possibility but I need more research to say that and again I need to balance up my risks and benefits because by you having the coil in the hormone coil you decrease your risk of womb of womb cancer by 20 percent there's a benefit there yeah and here we are back in our scenario of trying to put things on the scale um, and the risk of an unwanted pregnancy or the risk of a wanted pregnancy, even at the age of 50, there are significant risks both to mum and baby. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. everybody needs to go and have that conversation to weigh up those risks and benefits. You know, we, we can offset the risk through lifestyle. You, you talked about, um, you know, exercise. Uh, do, you, do you give out particular advice around diet? I mean, I know that that's like a, <laughs> an Aladdin's cave with, I mean, so many different sort of schools of thought all, all around it. But um, on, on a basic level, what should we be doing diet wise, do you think, to try and offset some, some of the risks as we age? Um, there's definitely things that you can do lifestyle wise. So stop smoking. Um, I say that to everyone. Um, and it's interesting what makes what what's the trigger that makes people do that? So sometimes it's when they're pregnant or when they have children. Sometimes it's when they hit the menopause and their skin ages much quicker because smoking mm-hmm. really affects the quality of your skin. Um, but but I had a, a patient quite recently and it was she was talking she had a breast issue um, and and I said you know when the smoking affects the quality of your skin and your breasts are mostly held up by connective tissue and skin and she said gosh smoking is going to potentially make them sag more and then she was like well I don't want that <laughs> that's <laughs> enough to convince me yes so it's interesting what what's what's the trigger not heart attacks or strokes or lung cancer you know it's just it's very interesting and um, so stop smoking alcohol is a really big one when it comes to breast cancer um and actually it's not just um it's not it sorry the risk of breast cancer is related to how much you drink mm. so it not well if i drink up to the 14 units it's safe no those those are maximum amounts those aren't mm-hmm. guidelines it's not hit five <laughs> it's it's not not target. Hit 14. yeah we're not aiming for 14 units of alcohol <laughs> a week. um but actually the more you drink the higher you the higher your risk so if you don't drink at all that risk comes down significantly exercise reduces your risk of breast cancer it reduces your risk of recurrence of breast cancer cancer if you have had it it also um has other benefits in that it helps um with osteoporosis we want weight bearing exercise for that every Mm -hmm. time you bang your foot down on the floor you cause micro trauma which breaks your bones down and that triggers your bones to grow back more we want resistance-based exercise to keep up our muscle mass um you know that we want to do we want exercise exercise for all kinds of reasons including our mental health it helps you sleep um, and it helps with low mood anxiety stress etc etc so definitely all of those things when it comes to diet um there are benefits for different parts so your gut microbiome um would like you to eat 30 different plant-based foods a week fruits vegetables herbs nuts seeds pulses um you know all of those kinds of things um and your gut microbiome there's a part of it called the estroblome which both responds to and is affected by estrogen so Mm. yes i want you to eat five portions of fruit and veg a day but it doesn't have to be the same ones every day so your gut microbiome loves a little bit of diversity fiber um to help keep your guts healthy and that microbiome healthy which then again may have an impact on everything else we know that your risk of heart disease goes up um as you get older so we would love you to have more unsaturated fats less saturated fats ultra processed foods um are actually affect both your appetite and your satiety, so how 
hungry you are and how full up you get. So the more food that you can make yourself or as whole food, dairy, please, um, because we need the calcium. Um, or And if you don't have dairy, we need to find another way of getting in the calcium. But that doesn't mean that I'm suggesting that you should take a calcium supplement. And I don't recommend that unless a doctor tells you that you need to, because high levels of calcium are also dangerous. Um, we would love for you to eat lean proteins and oily fish. Um, but there are lots of things that you can do. A Mediterranean style diet is very mm. helpful. When it comes to the menopause in particular, there is also the question about phytoestrogens, which are plant-based estrogens that you can find in foods. And in countries where women eat a diet that's naturally rich in that, so places like Japan, it seems to be that they have fewer menopausal symptoms. Ooh. Now, that's really difficult to understand the why behind mm -hmm. the association. So association is not the same as causation. So I'm a short person, I am five foot tall, and I have brown curly hair. If we do a study that shows that 100 women with brown curly hair are also five foot tall, we can say there seems to be an association. But we can't say that having brown curly hair makes you short mm. because we don't know that. We've just mm -hmm. noticed that two things are associated. When you notice an association, you can then go and look for that causation and we won't find it with brown curly hair. But when it comes to phytoestrogens, we're saying, okay, there seems to be an association here. There may be a biological basis for that, but how long do you need to eat them? Do you need to eat them your whole life? Or can mm -hmm. you just eat them when you hit perimenopause? How much do you have to eat a day? There are so many, many unanswered questions. However, these are healthy foods. These are soy-based foods and mushrooms and cucumber. And if you like them, eat them. They're not going to cause you any harm, but I can't promise you that they're going to cause yeah. benefit. But there are foods that you can eat which are making your symptoms worse. So alcohol makes your symptoms worse. Caffeine can make your symptoms worse. Spicy food can make hot flushes worse. So there is definitely thing, there are definitely things that you can do to improve your symptoms, whether or not you are also mm -hmm. taking treatment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've inspired me to go and look up phytoestrogens now. <laughs> look at which foods I should be chomping on. Definitely going to try that. Um, just as a final question, I wanted to come back to uh, your breast book um, because it, it feels like um, it's a pretty misunderstood part of the body that we just don't even think about, but is, is very important um for, for for a woman i mean how do you think um well, how do we misunderstand breasts as a body part do you think it's not our fault mm. and the reason that i say it's not our fault is that as someone who's been in women's health for you know more i don't know I've been qualified for nearly 20 years. Um, so, you know, for a while now, it feels like that we're shouting into the wind. Why aren't things changes? The pill and the abortion act and HRT were discovered in the 60s. And we are now 40 years later, no, sorry, 60 years later. Why aren't we hugely moving? Well, actually, we're fighting millennia of misogyny and paternalistic attitudes to women's health and millennia of women being valued only for what they look like and the babies that they can produce. And change does not happen overnight. And so it's frustrating, but it takes time. And when it comes to breast health, when we think about what are the roles of breasts, the first might, I mean, I'm not, I'm not putting them in an order, I'm just saying mm, them mm. in an order, would be from a purely animal, animalistic point of view is to feed young. Well, that's not about the women themselves, that's about the babies that they're feeding. The second role might be for sexual attraction, again, not about the women themselves. And so you think, well, it's not any wonder that women often feel that their breasts don't belong to them. But yet the primary focus is always on what can breasts do for other people? And until we can separate that, until we can separate women's health from women's roles in society and women's cultural roles, they're actually we're going to continue to do harm to women um, because that silence causes problems. The gender pain gap is a very real thing um which is that women's pain is often um, misunderstood and misdiagnosed and taken less seriously and we know that from childbirth and period pain and all kinds of things and this idea that to be a woman is to deal with pain i mean mm -hmm. just rubbish 
But actually, if you think about how you talk to your friends about breasts, what's the dialogue is out there about breasts and comment on people comment on what they look like and whether or not someone had nipple gate, you know, whether or not there's a breastfeeding woman on the cover of time, but not the fact that 70 percent of women have breast pain related to their periods. Mm. Not the fact that women's breasts hurt when they run for the bus because 80% of us are not wearing correctly fitted bras. That mm. the research into running shoes in comparison to the research into sports bras weighs so much heavily down on the running shoes. Thousands and thousands and thousands of studies versus a handful on sports bras. That, you know, the professional athletes are only just beginning in the last decade to think about how that impacts. And so, we need to change that conversation to how we live with breasts because if there are positive aspects for having breasts there's also a cost to living with them and that's not just the spectrum of breast cancer but pain and infections and you know and all mm -hmm. kinds of things mm -hmm. and, and that's what we need to be talking about mm -hmm. but it's a really hard thing for us to do because we're fighting such a long period of time yeah. um, and I think it's things take time and it's conversations like these which help start and that's why I wrote the breast book because mm -hmm. we have to take ownership of our bodies because if we're not going to look after them never mind get pleasure from them no one else will and that's <laughs> what I wanted this book to be about to be empowering to say they're yours when they're bothering you, when they're not bothering you, what is the basic maintenance that you need to do? How do you examine yourself? How do you know if your bra is fitting? Even if it is fitting, how long is it going to continue to fit for? All of those questions need to be in our psyche and we need to be teaching them to our daughters and, and you know, and children and everybody else so that new generations don't grow up knowing as little as we did and do. And so for me, this book is about empowering people to take control. Well, that's a great message. And that has been half an hour packed with just great advice and information. Thank you so much for that. Um, I do wish you well as well um, on your own health journey. And um, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Dr. Philippa. Thanks. Well, I hope you found that interview helpful and informative. If so, I'd love if you would consider giving the video a thumbs up and subscribing to see more interviews and content from this channel around looking and feeling good for longer. For today, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.